we continue in the study of Ezra. Ezra chapter 3. <clears throat> There's a difference between starting a work and trying to restart one. <laughs> and Ezra's trying to go back to restart the work. And of course, there was a number there who were young uh, children when the exile happened and they've come back and things are in ruins. Uh, and uh, wondering, well, how, how are we going to do this? Because remember, when Israel went into the land originally, they had a couple million people. Fifty thousand. And so, uh, the number one reason, of course, that they were to go back was to what? Yeah, rebuild the temple. I mean, that was a commandment. The king says, I want you to go back and rebuild the temple. Well, they got kind of a slow start on that one. <laughs> it took Solomon seven years to build a temple, but Solomon had several advantages. Not only did he have a lot more people, a lot more resources, but he had this connection with the Hiram, king of, uh, of Lebanon, Tyre, Sidon, and and made deals with him to bring down cedar wood and and had stonemasons and all these at their hand. Well, these uh, coming back here in Israel didn't have to use a modern term that much gravitas. <laughs> there was it wasn't that kind of connection, and so uh, they're coming back. Uh, their goal is to rebuild the temple. Uh, it's a kind of a struggle. So let's take a look at chapter 3 here of some of the issues that they faced. And when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, and his brethren built the altar of God in Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. And it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its base. They offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening burnt offerings. They also kept the Feast of the Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by the ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered a regular burnt offering and those for the new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated. And those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord for the first day of the seventh month began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon uh, to the sea, to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, uh, all the way through the Old Testament, we'll see this port city of Joppa. It's the only natural port in Israel. Uh, it's near the modern city of Haifa, you know. And, of course, when Gene and I were in Israel, we walked through Joppa. And, of course, the guy said, Peter walked this very street. And this was the very house well. We kind of think, yeah. You know. But you know how tourist industry goes, you know. And so three months after the exiles returned to Jerusalem, they began their renewed worship. Uh, unlike the pagan religions, all the sacrifices had to take place in one spot, the temple, and the altar had to be on the exact spot where it used to stand. Pagan altars could be anywhere. As a matter of fact, it was estimated that in Babylon alone, there were 1,200 altars. <laughs> so you didn't have to go far. It's sort of like a convenience store. You, know, you didn't have to go far, you know, for, to go to an altar, you know. So they had over 1,200 in Babylon. Now, the seventh month is, is 
and actually September, October in our calendar, uh, is the month of Tishri in the Jewish calendar. It's a Jewish first month. Now, the word September uh, means seventh. The word October means eighth. The word November means ninth. The word December, Deki, tenth. So it used to be the seventh month until Julius Caesar decided he needed a month, and he put the month of July in there. Well, not to be outdone, his nephew Octavius, who was Augustus Caesar, had to have a month, too, of equal length, so he put the month of August there. So now the seventh month is the ninth month, and the eighth month, so it gets a little bit confusing. So Julius and Augustus Caesar, the Roman calendar, put their months in the middle there. And so September, October held three important celebrations for the Jews. First of all, it's the Feast of the Trumpets. It's Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year. Their new year is in September. Ours is in January. Why? I have no idea. But, you know, I mean, it's kind of a weird place to start a new year, but, you know, it's the uh, middle of January. Of course, it's a weird place to start a day at midnight, but that's another story, right? And so uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of the Trumpets, the new year. Then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement was in the same month. And then, and as you get into October, you had the festival of Sukkoth, which huts, the Feast of the Tabernacles, celebrating when Israel was in the, or commemorating at least, Israel in the wilderness and, and stayed in tents. And so, they, so there was three important months. So after they came to land, they set up things and they <clears throat> began to, the feast days at the beginning of the year, which sound like a natural place to start it. Now, before the sacrifice could be made, the altar had to be built. The altar of the temple was on the spot where David built an altar to stay the plague. Second uh, Samuel 24, at the threshing floor of Aranu, or Arana, and uh, the plague was stayed. 70,000 people died in that plague. Remember, that was after David had numbered the people and the prophet came and said, now listen, choose you what your punishment's going to be. Uh, either uh, three days before the hand of the Lord, uh, three months of uh, running before your enemy, or three years of plague. Well, so David said, that's easy. The Lord's merciful. We also found out the Lord's holy. <laughs> and said, I'll do it for the, well, this plague. And so David purchased his threshing floor and, and bought it, made sacrifice. This is also the same place where Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac. This is Mount Moriah. And uh, he sacrificed a ram instead. So it's a very important, you know, religiously, historical spot in Israel. Now the high priest Jeshua, by the way, this is the only book of which it's called Jeshua. The rest of the place is called Joshua. <laughs> same name. Uh, Joshua led the priest. Remember, this was not a Zerubbabel thing. This is a religious thing. When it came to governmental things, Zerubbabel was the leader. When it came to religious things, the high priest was the leader. And so Joshua led the priest and the Levites to setting up the altar on the exact spot where the original was. It's the only legitimate place that sacrifices could have been made. The sacrifice at the altar... Uh, for the trumpets and the new moons and the evening and morning sacrifice and the free will offerings and Yom Kippur, tabernacles had not been used for 70 years. And so this is the first time you had the worship renewal uh, for 70 years. There will not be another uh, sacrifice made at that spot until the tribulation, which is a different study. <laughs> Uh, working on being prayer about that. I finished the study. I've actually got the, the books in, you know, for the Vacation Bible School, but it's only for the first coming. I'm working on a sequel. Prophecy's dealing with the second coming. So, now whether it'll be done by Vacation Bible School, I don't know. But anyway, so we'll have a part one and part two. Enough for the commercial. Back to the message. Now, <laughs> uh, Every detail of the offering had to be made exactly the way it was 
in the book of Leviticus. They had to follow exactly the same pattern, exactly the same uh, direction, exactly the same utensils, exactly the same people, you know, the, the positions, the freedom, all that had to be followed in exact detail. Now, even though, now once you picture this, even though the temple was in ruins, the altar now is functioning, so they're in the open like they were when they had the tabernacle. So right now, they have this open altar. Uh, probably would have been tough on rainy days, but uh, had this open altar with no building around. And when you looked all around, all was his ruins. Remember, it was all burned. All the stones were knocked down. Everything was destroyed. Now, you have what I call here jitters in Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, the inference here and in other passages is they expected to come back and things to be the way their grandparents had left, that they would go into their land, they would start all over. They, guess what they found? They found their people had moved on their land. They found that there were Amorites there, and there were Arabs there, and there were Canaanites there, and there were, uh, you know, Philistines had moved in, and and all kinds of people moved into the land. And so said so they were nervous, and they thought, well, if we start sacrificing, we just moved in with a good number of people and start sacrificing, perhaps the people in the land will rise up against us. So they were nervous, but they, they obeyed. They set up the altar. They began to sacrifice us. And so the... They were out, greatly outnumbered with the Arabs and the Amorites and the Ammonites and Samaritans and the Edomites, and they were not thrilled that the Jews had come back to the land. Does it sound like something familiar? They're still not thrilled that the Jews are back in the land in modern times. And so the Jews began their sacrifice with trepidation. And they were concerned about their safety, but they beseeched the Lord to help them in this sacrifice. Now, the real opposition will not rise for another century when Nehemiah starts building the wall, because now when you start building the wall, now you get in a, a fortified city, now you begin to build, you know, the nation, and all of a sudden they said, no, we, we, we can't do this, we can't have a you know, the Jewish nation rise up again. And so Nehemiah is going to have trouble. So when we look at the next book, we'll see all the difficulty that Nehemiah had. Now, the temple did not rise quickly. They didn't order a prefab and put up a building. <laughs> uh, the Jews had three assets to build the building. First of all, King Cyrus commanded it, so they had the grant. Secondly, much money had been raised. They had a lot of donations. They had money to pay carpenters and money to pay masons and money to pay to buy the material. Secondly, and there was obviously enough Jews to do the labor. So you had those three things going for you. But there are many hindrances to building the building. First of all, the material to build the building had to be re regathered. It, it wasn't there. The only thing that you can get out of the hills of around Jerusalem was a, a Judean limestone. <laughs> and uh, now if you ever go to Israel, you could see the Judean limestone they use for building. It's kind of a soft stone, you know. Uh, the harder stone, the more like granite type stone is, was mined up there near Mount Hermon. Hermon. And so they probably weren't going to use the Judean limestone there. Uh, secondly, they had no cedar there. Cedar wasn't growing there. They didn't have a cypress growing there. They didn't have these woods that would be required. Secondly, the people of the land did not want them to rebuild their temple. <laughs> I mean, there was opposition. Now, who are these Jews who they think they are? Remember, now, remember... Just because they had a grant from the king, the king did not send an army with them. The king was where? He was hundreds of miles to the east of them. 
So he did not send a force. Nehemiah had that advantage. He had a force with him when, when he came in, you know, but Zerubbabel did not. Uh, the altar was built and worship resumed. And so, well, we got worship going. What's the hurry, right? I mean, if you already have something working, well, we can take our time, you know, to get the rest. It's, Sounds like a government project. <laughs> we can take our time. The interest of the people began to diminish. And this is what the Haggai accused him of. Okay, you built your houses, you paneled your houses. What well, about the house of the Lord? The very reason the Lord sent you back was to build his house. Not so that you can build yours and live comfortably in the land. And so the efforts to build seem to be futile also compared to the grandeur of Solomon's temple. Now, let, let, let's, take a, let's take a look at that aspect in just a moment. Some of them are old enough to remember Solomon's temple. Say, wait a minute, we're going to build what? I mean, Solomon's temple had what in it? Right, it had bronze, and it had gold, and it had cedar, and it had cypress, and the floors were, were you know, polished, and the, you know, the, the artwork was amazing, and, and, uh, and we're going to build with what? <laughs> Remember, it took Solomon a long time with a lot of resources to collect all the stuff that was needed and so compare, so, so what's this going to look like compared to what it used to be? So what's the use? Listen, the Lord says, I don't, I don't live in buildings. <laughs> if the Lord gives you a shanty, worship in a shanty. <laughs> if the Lord gives you a, you know, the Lord gives you a temple, worship in a temple. But, you know, the point isn't how beautiful this is, is, what worship is going to be taking place in this. And so there wasn't a lot of motivation. Now Haggai, when we get to the book of Haggai, which would take a while since we're going through this book by book, motivated the Jews to complete the temple. said, listen, you want me to tell you why you're not prospering? Why your animals are not fruitful? Why your crops fail, why you are not being fruitful and bearing children. Am I tell why? Because there you're sitting in your paneled houses and God's house is not built. I say rise and build. And it takes them 20 years to finally complete the task. So the purpose of returning to Jerusalem was to what? Build the temple. So they began to follow Solomon's lead now. They start purchasing cedar. They start purchasing cypress. Uh, they begin to give, you know, food and drink and stuff like that and payment to come down. The logs would be floated. What, what they did was they would tie the logs together raft style, float them down the, uh, coast of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, down to Joppa, and then they would be hauled over, uh, by, by carts over to the place where they were going to build. Now let me end by saying this before we have our discussion. You're either going to have enthusiasm to serve the Lord or you're going to have enthusiasm to take care of your own interests. You're not going to have both. And listen, initial emotional enthusiasm never last. The honeymoon period is over quickly. <laughs> there has to be a love for the Lord that's a choice love, that's a deeper commitment that lasts, that will gut through these things. As, uh, you know, H.B. Charles said at the pastor's thing, he says, you know, it has to gut through when Dr. Thorne visits your house. <laughs> And, and when that thorn in the flesh comes, are you still going to hang in there, right? Are you still going to push through? Well, their enthusiasm, they had grandeur. Every, I don't care who it is, every missionary I've ever met, when they started going to the field, had these grand ideas of what it was going to be like. 
And every seminary, seminary student coming out saying, boy, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this in this church and everything else. And wait a minute, there's people here. <laughs> there's obstacles here. It's not working the way I thought it would. Well, that's the point. Is, am I going to continue? Am I, am, am I going to push through? Is my enthusiasm for my dream and my idea or is it my enthusiasm for the Lord? And the Lord says, and that's why Haggai, when he stood up and gave a speech, said, listen, I, when they dedicated to him, said, listen, I know you old guys who are crying here. <laughs> Remember the old temple, and this looks like nothing to you. This looks like a shack. He said, thus saith the Lord, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, and I'll bring more glory to this temple than to the first one. Because it's that temple that Jesus Christ is dedicated in, in ministry during his ministry. And so don't despise things because they don't match up to your dream. Just be faithful to see what God's going to do, that he might receive the glory and not you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. We just pray, Lord, as we look upon the things that you have designed and you have called us to, Lord, that we'll be faithful in that. No matter what the obstacles, no matter what we have to press through, that your name might be glorified in and through us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Todd? Yeah, just how far apart were the altars, the one in the, uh, the, the, the temple and the tabernacle? You know, the, 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 the tabernacle one was where uh, Abraham offered the sacrifice to the ram, right? I'm a little well, confused that, by all these locations. Okay, okay, okay. The, 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 no, Abraham comes four, cent, four centuries before the tabernacle's built. He was before the law. So, um, so, so it was Mount Moriah. All right, let, let's see if we can, we can sort of picture this. There's four major hills that Jerusalem's built on. Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, Mount Ariel, and Mount Ophel. And Mount Moriah was where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. It is also where David buys the land to build the altar to uh, stay the plague in second. Samuel, so that's the exact same spot, location. Tabernacle is not built until Moses comes around four centuries after, uh, after Abraham. So, so the temple ends up where he was going to make that sacrifice of Isaac, you know. And so, now, interesting enough, Calgary is outside the gate. That's why I believe they got it wrong where the Catholic Church is, you know, uh, in there. That Mount um, Gordon's Calvary makes more sense. It's next to a hill that looks like a skull, place of the skull. It's outside the gate of Jerusalem, so Calgary is outside of that. It's outside, symbolically, it's outside the Old Testament law temple thing. It's a totally new thing. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Mariah's where where the temple the temple was built, where the altar. The the old where the old temple was. Well, because that's the only place sacrifices could be made. That's where they sent the altar up. Where was this? At Mount Mariah. That that's where they sent the, they they found they found the post where the altar sat, and they put a new altar on it. But the altar was just in the open air. <laughs> you know, there was no temple around. You know, and once they started sacrificing everything, they said, well, there's no rush to get the rest of the job done. <laughs> you know. God's not going to prosper with them until yeah, the temple a, done? Yeah, that's, that was God's house. That's where he wanted sacrifice. That's where the people were to come to worship. The problem was not 
the temple, the problem was the hearts of the people. <laughs> you can sacrifice all you want, but if your heart's not with God, it doesn't mean anything. Anyone else? Well, in other words, the Lord sent you back to build a temple, so he wants you to do what? He wants you to build a temple. He says, now that you decide I'm going to build my house and forget the temple, he says, I'm not going to prosper you. You build your house and you're not going to build mine, you know. In fact, we have that indication all the way back in First Kings where the scriptures note that Solomon took seven years to build a temple, but he took 13 years to build his own house. <laughs> That sort of indicates, you know, where his heart was, right? It seemed to be, Lee. <laughs> yeah, so the, the passage in Acts with uh, Gamaliel, right, when he's trying to convince his Jewish people, saying, hey, if, if Jesus' death and resurrection is from men, it, it'll go away. But if it isn't, if it's from God, you can't stop it lest you be found to fight against God. It seems just that this whole act of even trying to rebuild the temple, the massiveness of it, and maybe this ties into your prophecy uh, outlines as well for the summer. It's a, it's a, you know, Cyrus is not even a believer, right? In, in Jewish theology, he's, he's having all these people do all this stuff. So it's just, it's evident that the hand of God's on it. Well, I exactly right. You know, now there, there's two things, you know, there's two things there that we have to know. First of all, God can motivate a people, but the people have to respond. You know, they can go and have enthusiasm, but if the enthusiasm is, oh, look what we're going to do, well, forget it. The motivation has to be received and respond. And secondly, if a people uh, really love the Lord, they're going to make him the priority and not themselves. Lee? Sorry, I, that spurned another question on. In the New Testament, when Jesus did various miracles and stuff, sometimes he came across someone he, he didn't heal. Uh, is that partly because they did not respond in belief? Yeah, that's a good question. There's, there's been debates over that. Some, some he did not heal because he had some different purpose in their, in, in their lives. I mean, there's, uh, in the book The Row by, uh, see, Lord Douglas, um, they ran across, you know, uh, Tiberius, uh, the, the, the Tribune, uh, what was Marcellus, I think his name was, ran across a woman that he didn't heal. He said, well, why didn't he heal you? He said, the Lord had something different for me. It didn't diminish her faith, but for his own purpose, you know, we don't know. There are other passages that says everybody came to me healed. Some passages... He didn't heal, you know. Matter of fact, he tells Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Anyone else? Go ahead, Lee. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. It, um, uh, Eli's wicked sons, right? Uh, as far as them turning away or turning to the Lord, uh, Scripture says there the Lord intended to kill them. Yeah. Right. And it and it, it it goes back to did they disbelieve God? They obviously did, uh, but obviously God wasn't allowing them to turn back either. You know, it's a conundrum. Well, yeah, you can. And, and, and Paul makes that mention over in Second uh, Corinthians, chapter ten, where he says, "I come to give you gospel. I didn't take anything from you, even though I could have." You know. You do not muzzle the ox that treads the grain. He said, but there are some who come to make gain out of you, to trick you, to get money out of you. You know, he says, those people you'll accept. You know, so there are people who use religion for gain. Right, let me tell you a story. <laughs> uh, had a, a wing meeting last Tuesday, and uh, the safety... Uh, Officer, he said, I'm sending you something, don't laugh. Well, he sent away for an ordination certificate, you know, so he can marry and marry. He's, you know, he's a deacon in the Methodist church. 
everything. You sent away a certain money, you uh, take a look. So they said 20 million pastors ordained through us. It's a uh, universal church monastery, you know. And so you can just send away a certificate, and now you're an ordained pastor, you know. I mean, that's the type of people we're talking about, you know. I said, yeah, you got to be kidding. Uh, I said, I'm sure you can send away and get your pilot's license the same way. I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, Lee? <laughs> no, it, I, I know. He said, accepted in, in millions of places. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Any, any other questions? Yeah, he knew their hearts. But he gives them an opportunity. They have to choose. You know, and we'll end with this, and John will have you close. You might think you love the Lord and would do anything for him, but until that's tested, you don't know. Do you really love the Lord? You know, uh, if, you know, I, Bill, I think you asked the question a couple of weeks ago. It's the fact that if you know, somebody who, loves the Lord and everything else, and all of a sudden some real tragedy in their life, and they drift away where they really saved. Don't you think we're going to be tested? You know, 1 Peter 4 is very important. It says, when trials come to you, why do you think some strange things happen to you? You know, did not the Lord tell us we're going to be tested? Is not our proof of faith in passing the test? Remain faithful. I mean, the old Job 13, 15 uh, passage where it says, even if he kills me, yet I'm going to trust him. And so why do you think we're not going to be tested? Well, yeah, that's where he meets, uh, meets the people in worship, you know. That, that, and a lot of this has to do with obedience. Obedience. Are you going to obey me? Go ahead, John. Father, we thank you again for being in your house this morning for a study of your word, for a Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Father, for these passages from Ezra that shows us the, uh, the, the process that was going through and the challenges that the people were met with and how they responded. And it also gives us insight, Father, to what you also expect from us as we um, face life's challenges that we would just remain faithful to you, Lord, and um, understand that testing will come and that you are faithful to bring us through the, the struggles as we look upon you and serve you. We ask now, Father, as we close this portion of the service, that you would be with us as we uh, go into the 11 o'clock hour and look forward, Father, to worshiping you through song, study of your word, through meditation, and through service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.